Today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. Prayers that are prayed according to the will of God are winning prayers. So I think it's pretty encouraging to realize that when you and I don't know what the will of God is, the Holy Spirit knows and He's praying for you according to the will of God. I think that's a prayer that's going to get answered. It's a great thought. Do you ever feel like you're getting into a rut with your prayer life, like the words always come out the same and you're not sure how to express your thoughts and concerns to God? Well, today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy describes the interceding ministry of the Holy Spirit and how God can direct our thoughts and prayers. To learn more about this ministry, visit ktt.org. But now, helping us to know where to turn when we're lost for words, here is Pastor Philip DeCourcy. Let's listen. I want to come to Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 and 27. And as we continue to look at the advantageous ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian, we want to pay some attention to the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Christian's prayer life. We've looked at a number of aspects of his ministry in our life, and here is another one. It is the Spirit of God who enables us to pray. It is the Spirit of God that makes the Christian active in prayer, and it is the Spirit of God that makes the Christian effective in prayer. That's a ministry of the Holy Spirit that's often overlooked. And so let's begin to look at this text. Now, there's three things here. Number one, if you're taking notes, our confusion. When it comes to prayer, we often find ourselves confused. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We know we ought to pray. Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, man ought always to pray. Sometimes we're not sure what to pray in a given situation. I think that Paul is addressing a particular situation in your life and my life where we come to a place where we're confused I don't think Paul's talking about prayer in general, because I think we know what we ought to pray for in general. In fact, Jesus gave us a map. Jesus said, when you pray, say. So we know what we ought to pray generally, but there are some times in a hospital or beside a bed or you're making a life decision, you're not sure what is the particular will of God. What is the best decision you can make given this particular personal set of circumstances. Have you ever been there? Then Paul joins you with some words of advice. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. This is the problem. We don't know what to pray because we're weak. We're weak. That's what Paul acknowledges. Now, what does that mean? In a narrow sense, I think it relates to our ignorance. We don't know the mind of God. Sometimes we don't even know our own hearts. We don't know what's best for us, and we don't know at times what constitutes God's best. His ways are past finding out, says Paul. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, says Isaiah. But in a broader sense, I think the weakness relates to our own fallen condition. We're very much part of a world that's flawed and feeble and finite. Put this down, roll it over in your mind. Prayer and weakness are joined at the hip. Prayer and weakness are joined at the hip. Prayer is for the helpless and for the hapless. God is attracted to your weakness because he resists the pride and he gives grace to the humble. Prayer is a sense of helplessness plus faith in God. There's a good definition of prayer. Prayer is our helplessness plus faith in God. The word helps here in verse 26, it's a uh, composite term in the Greek grammar. 
It's a root word with two prefixes. That's all you need to know. It has a word, and two prefixes are built onto the front end of that word. The word itself means to bear or to carry. And the two prefixes are against and with. With, against, carry. It's a word that means this, to carry over and against. Okay, what's the picture? A.T. Robertson, the great Greek Grammarian Southern Baptist, he tells us in his word studies that what you've got here is the picture of someone lifting a log. Well, somebody's on one end, and over and against, someone is carrying on the other end. That's the picture. It's a beautiful picture. When you and I go to lift our prayers up before God, and we can't get them up because they're held down by our ignorance, our inability, our weakness, our feebleness. We really don't know what we ought to pray. Sometimes we don't even know how to pray really as well as we should. All of a sudden, the prayers get lifted because on the other end, the Spirit of God takes up our prayers. It's a beautiful picture. But the Spirit's help in praying is not an excuse to replace our praying with His praying. This is not an excuse for us to stop praying. It's just a reminder when we fumble and mumble in our prayers, we've still got to do that like a little child coming to our Father, but the Spirit of God comes along over and against us to help us. Two things. As we look at this fact that our weak prayers are triggered by His strong prayers, I want you to see the Spirit's intercession. I want you to see the Spirit's interpretation. The Spirit of God is said here to make intercession for us. Now, we know that's true of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at chapter 8 and verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us. But here we're told in the very passage where the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ is exalted, we also have the Spirit of God interceding for us. He takes up our case and through Christ presents it to God. What a blessing. If I may put it like this, the Spirit of God puts a good word in for us when we're lost for words. The Christian has two advocates working on his behalf. We have Christ interceding in heaven, and we have the Holy Spirit interceding on the earth. The one works in the higher court, the one works in the lower court. Jesus Christ works in the court of heaven. The Holy Spirit works in the theater of our hearts. And there is a happy harmonization between the prayers of Christ and the pleas of the Spirit. Listen to these words by William Hendrickson, the great Presbyterian commentator on this very thought. Romans 8 teaches that believers have two intercessors, the Holy Spirit and Christ. Christ performs His intercessory task in heaven, the Holy Spirit on earth. Christ's intercession takes place outside of us. The Holy Spirit's within us. That is, in our very own hearts. Christ prays that the merits of His redemptive work may be fully applied to those who trust in Him. The Holy Spirit prays that the deeply hidden needs of our hearts, needs which we ourselves sometimes don't even recognize, may be met. This beautiful thought that we've got Christ in heaven The Holy Spirit on earth, Christ praying outside of us, the Holy Spirit praying within us, both working together to present our prayers to God. That's a great thought. When we find ourselves in the midst of life, and there we stand scratching our heads, and we don't know what to pray for. Well, we have for our confusion, our companion, the Holy Spirit. Do you see the Spirit's intercession? And secondly, do you see the Spirit's interpretation? This is an interesting verse. He intercedes for us. But then Paul goes on to explain what that intercession is. He prays for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit is said to intercede for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, groans that words cannot express. That's the meaning of the text. Yearnings that are too deep for words, divine articulations from the Spirit to the Father on our behalf for stuttering, stammering saints. That's beautiful. Leon Morris in his comedy in Romans, wants us to note that the text doesn't strictly say that the Spirit groans himself. It says he intercedes with groans or in groans that cannot be uttered. 
And Leon Morris would make this connection, and I tend to agree with him, that those groans are our groans. They come from the Spirit, but they've been taken from us. Okay, he's interceding for us. He's coming alongside us. He's over and against us. So he hears us some night in our bedroom, at our office desk, with our head down, our heart broken, our minds confused, and the Spirit's listening in and helping us. And he hears our heart in a way we don't even understand it. And then he takes it and conveys that to the Father with groans too deep for words to express. It's beautiful. What's going on is, in our state of confusion, the Holy Spirit comes along and he grasps what our needs are. He grasps that within the will of God, and then he presents a prayer that is so perfectly tailored for our situation, a prayer that you and I just don't have the mind or the heart to pray. We're so weak, so fallen, so flawed, so feeble. This is a phenomenal passage of Scripture because, you see, there's a whole argument being built up here. Go to verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groans. Look at verse 23. We ourselves groan. Look at verse 26. And the Spirit himself groans. James Montgomery Boyce says this of that string of verses that sets before us the groaning of the creation, the groaning of the Christian, and the groaning of the Holy Spirit. He says this of that This world groans. It's imperfect, burdened, weighed down with the consequences of Adam's sin and God's judgment, moral, environmental, physical, so forth, so on. And if you and I are living in it as flawed people, we're going to groan. There's going to be days we wish we didn't live. There's going to be days we wonder what life is all about. And so the world groans, makes us groan, and God doesn't leave us in our own sorrow and our own sign, the Holy Spirit comes alongside over and against us and he hears our heart's cry. Even when we don't have the words to express the heart's cry and then he takes that perfectly and presents it to God. Is that not wonderful? What we're really saying here is that the Holy Spirit is the clearing house for our prayers. Okay, he sorts them out. And he takes the weak prayers and he makes them strong. He takes the unfinished prayers and he makes them complete. He takes the childish prayers and he makes them mature. He takes the wrong prayers and he makes them right. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself prays with groanings too deep for words. We as praying persons are being prayed for by the Holy Spirit himself. And those prayers get fixed on the way up. That's beautiful gives us confidence, helps us rest. A couple of practical points here to get to the last one. I got to say this. I'm not trying to be unduly controversial. It must be pointed out that this section, given what we have already come to understand of it, in no way addresses the issue of tongues. Because this very passage and these very verses are used by some to justify private prayer languages or colossalia. But that cannot be the case for a number of reasons. Number one, the gift of tongues is expressed in words that are then interpreted according to Corinthians. They are not inarticulate groans. While this prayer offered by the Holy Spirit may be wordless, let's not conclude it was meaningless. The Holy Spirit conveys it in the in a way understandable to the Father. Secondly, the gift of tongues is only given to some, according to 1 Corinthians. While this is an issue and a privilege here in Romans 8, verse 26 to 27, for all Christians. And thirdly, the two previous uses of the word groan in Romans 8 give no hint of some mysterious prayer language. It's the sigh of a human heart. It's the cry of the heart. It's the sobbing, sorrowing heart that the Spirit of God hears and prayers for. Another thought, we don't need to fall over ourselves trying to find the right words to pray to God. That's another implication. We've clarified that it has nothing to do with private prayer languages or colossalia, but on the other hand, we do want to take this practical PowerPoint home and live it out. We don't have to try and find the right words to pray. He knows what we need before we ask. 
He knows our limitations. He knows our walk in this world is a spiritual twilight experience where we only know in part. And therefore, God is not looking for eloquent, perfectly parsed, perfectly phrased prayers. He's attracted to our weakness and nothing more. And you and I need to remind ourselves of that. All that God is looking for is for a hunger and a thirst after him. He's looking for a heart disposition that longs for his grace and for his glory, even at times when we're dumbstruck. Prayer at times, guys, is simply a heart cry to God. It can be a yearning. At times it can be a yell. It can be a grunt. It can be a groan. As long as the heart disposition is right and there's a throwing of yourself before God and his mercy, asking for his guidance, asking for his strengthening grace, that groan is interpreted. Yet yell is heard. That unspoken request is understood. Last thought, our confidence. This text is calculated to bring a confidence to those who are struggling to make a sense of life to make good on prayer. Likewise, the Spirit helps in our weakness, and He prays for us when we don't know what to pray, and He intercedes with groans. For he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Paul wants the Christian to know that their mumbled and jumbled prayers make it to heaven and beg an answer from God for two reasons. One, because he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. We could spend some time here. I'll break it down for you. Just as saying there's no miscommunication between the Spirit and the Father. There's nothing lost in translation, okay? That when we are lost for words, okay, we don't know what to pray for. The Spirit of God intercedes with groans too deep for words. So he's groaning on our behalf to the Father, We don't know what to pray. We don't have the words. Then the Spirit is praying with groans too deep for words. But words are unnecessary because the God knows the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit of God knows our needs, conveys that to God. God knows the Spirit's mind. Hey, presto, the prayers are heard, and they beg an answer from God. It's a wonderful thought. Our ignorance is offset by God's knowledge of us and the Father's knowledge of the Spirit who's interceding on our behalf. And then there's a second reason why we can be confident. Look at this at the end of verse 27. We're nearly done. He makes intercession for the saints who? The Spirit, high, through groans that can't be uttered, according to the will of God. How important is it to pray according to the will of God? Really important. Prayers that begin in heaven or prayers that get to heaven. Jesus taught us, hey, guys, you want to know how to pray? Well, here's how you need to pray. You need to pray that God's will gets done on earth as it's done in heaven. We're told in 1 John 5, 14, what? If we ask anything according to his will, you get answered. Prayers that are prayed according to the will of God are winning prayers. So I think it's pretty encouraging to realize that when you and I in a particular set of circumstances, don't know what the will of God is. Someone knows, the Holy Spirit knows, and he's praying for you according to the will of God. I think that's a prayer that's going to get answered. It's a great thought. And that gives us confidence. When we are stuttering and stammering, we can't give voice to our heart's desire. I've been there, you've been there. The Holy Spirit relays and portrays perfectly to God the needs of our heart and how those needs can be met within his will. Finish with this idea. You and I need to grasp God probably answers all our prayers, but not as we prayed them. Because you see, our prayer wasn't the finished product. The Spirit had to work with it, and the Son of God had to work with it, reshaping it, representing it to God. But you and I can have a calm assurance that God has perfectly heard our prayers because our heart's desire has been perfectly communicated by the Spirit. And therefore, those prayers will be answered, but sometimes not as we imagine. That's why Jerry Sitzer says this. It could be that there is no such a thing as unanswered prayer. What we interpret as no might really be no, not that way. 
or not yet. Unanswered prayer, according to our perspective, does not mean unanswered prayer according to God's perspective. That's helpful. That's really helpful. Maybe that's why Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, said, we ask for silver and God gives gold. See, we're ignorant. We're bound by our self-interest at times. Our perspective is limited and finite. And sometimes when we ask for silver, he gives gold. That's why the next verse will say, all things work together for good. Did you notice where verse 26 started? We do not know. And verse 28 begins, we know. What makes the difference? How do we get from we don't know, do we know? Because in the in-between, we have this assurance that the Spirit of God is perfectly presenting our heart's desires, our confused ideas to God according to the will of God. And then God crafts answers and within his providence brings all of our life and all of its circumstances together, perfectly working it for our good. It's phenomenal. Let's pray. Lord, keep reminding us that we're better off with uh, Jesus in heaven and the Holy Spirit on earth. He is the other comforter. And we thank you for the comfort we have received in our muddled and befuddled life's experience. That when we don't know what to pray, and even how to pray it, how to articulate it, that the Spirit of God listens for our heart's cry, for our deepest yearnings and desires. And then, in groanings too deep for words, portrays and relays that to our Father perfectly according to the will of God. Oh, God, help us to be encouraged today. Prayer is not about performance. It's not about eloquence. We thank you that uh, our future blessing doesn't hang or fall on the brilliance of our praying, but in the adequacy of of the Spirit's intercession. Oh, we thank you that probably more than we realize all our prayers are being answered, but not as we prayed them. Therefore, help us to trust you. Help us to realize there is no risk in trusting God with the answers to our prayers. And everybody said, Amen. When the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we can be sure that our cares and concerns are carried directly to the Father. This is Know the Truth, and you're listening to a message from Philip DeCourcy called Lost for Words. To replay this lesson, listen online at ktt.org. At Know the Truth, our primary objective is to share the gospel with a world in need of truth through radio and Internet platforms, as we firmly believe that salvation is found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're also dedicated to equipping you in your faith journey by providing valuable resources— And this month, we're excited to offer a book titled God in You by Dr. David Jeremiah. For many believers, the mystery of the Holy Spirit remains just that, a mystery. But God in You is an eye-opening guide to this often misunderstood member of the Trinity as it explores the Holy Spirit in concrete terms and leaves abstract concepts behind. And when you give a gift of any amount to know the truth, you'll receive a copy of this insightful book with our thanks. Just call 888-644-8811 or give online at ktt.org. Now, another part of Know the Truth's mission is to equip godly leaders. And Philip, this week, you've got a big event coming up that aligns with this mission. Yes, our annual Entrust Men's Conference for Leaders is coming up on May the 2nd. The theme is Counterculture, the Uncompromising Church. We'll be tackling the pressing issues we face in today's ever-changing society. And we'd love for you to join us in person or online. Yes, we sure would. And you can register and learn more at entrustconference.org. Thank you, Philip. Well, that's all the time we have today. I'm Wade Shepard, inviting you to come back tomorrow for more Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.